Wow, that saved me from having to sort of give you all the all that info. So thank you, thank you very much. Well, thank you all for coming out on this uh, chilly pre-Halloween evening. We're excited to have you all here um, for this presentation. And you know, I, th I think this is really going to be something that people will walk away with a lot, a lot of new information. My name is Jamie Axelrod. I'm the Director of Disability Resources here at NAU. And I'm so happy to have with us here Paul Grossman, who is the former Chief Regional Attorney for the Department of Education Office for Civil Rights and faculty member at Hastings College of Law. And I'm also really proud to call Paul uh, a mentor of mine in this area, but even more importantly, a friend. So I'll, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Paul. Thank you, Jamie. Am I on? Thank you. So uh, I guess it's fair that to say I was once Jamie's mentor, but if you know Jamie, you know ultimately he becomes your mentor. And uh, this particular uh, presentation is no exception because uh, Jamie specifically asked me to look into the issue of intersectionality and uh, disability rights. And the more I thought about my own experience in this area, the more I agreed with him that this is a very important uh, topic to be covering. So I'm, I'm grateful for Jamie for bringing this and any number of other issues to my attention. And just to demonstrate how dedicated I am to Jamie, this is the first PowerPoint I've ever written by candlelight. <laughs> okay, so. Okay, and my wife tells me they have power back, so we're gonna see if we can get this to work. I, I have a plan B if this doesn't work, but you guys wanna hit something and see if we can do it? Yeah, there we go. So uh, I won't spend any time on this except to say that I'm not your lawyer and you can't sue me for malpractice. And, uh, I do give people permission to get from Jamie uh, a copy of this provided that you Xerox it or you convert it to alternate media like Braille or something like that, but please don't post it on the internet. And that is my direct home office email address and you're very welcome to contact me uh, directly um, at any time. So um, I'm a very, very lucky individual in terms of uh, my career path. Uh, I spent 40 years as a civil rights attorney in education for the federal government. And as a result of being in that position, I was actually able to watch the unfolding of American civil rights history in education. So when I came on, I was one of about, I think, 100 or so young lawyers who were hired straight out of law school to implement what was called the Supreme Court's all deliberate speed decision, which meant 20 years after Brown v. Board of Education, when no schools were integrated, uh, we were sent to try to uh, make Brown v. Board of Education a real decision. And uh, my particular assignment was the state of Arkansas. And um, I'm sorry, I don't have time tonight to give you all kinds of wild stories about how the FBI and I worked together, which we did, uh, in Arkansas, but it was a very interesting experience. But then um, I went on to work on uh, national origin rights. And um, uh, right after the Department of Education was formed, our biggest issue was how many kids whose first language was not English were flunking out of school. This was the single greatest failure that was going on in education. And so um, I got to work on that issue and came up with uh, bilingual education plans for both the Los Angeles and Chicago public schools uh, and um, held hearings around the country on this issue. Um, sex and gender uh, issues came along and I worked on that as well. And um, the most interesting thing issue for me personally in my own practice was equal athletic opportunity. And just uh, by way of example, Fresno State uh, University in California had two thirds of the women's Olympic baseball team on their campus and their coach was the Olympic coach. And at night when they played baseball, 
they played it on a sand lot where people drove cars with headlights to shine. Whereas the men's team, which had a record of zero and 12, had a stadium and lights. And so we uh, took care of that uh, inequity. And then, uh, of course, I worked a lot in disability rights. And particularly for me, because I am an individual with multiple disabilities, um, I had an affinity for that issue. But what I want you to understand is it gave me a unique perspective because I did not see issues as disability rights, uh, race, national origin. To me, it was one big continuum. And I got to see how things addressed originally as race issues, then created lessons and tactics and techniques that would then go into the next area of law. But each area would contribute something more to our knowledge about how to address um, discrimination. And I uh, quote from Sue Schweik, who's probably the leading uh, authority on the disability rights movement. And she says, earlier social justice movements can be important for subsequent movements if the earlier movement still exists and can, and can provide support to the subsequent um, movement. And Schweik talks about how sometimes one group is not in solidarity with another group as much as it is in within fluidity with another group. In other words, Things from one group help to support another group, even if there isn't some kind of official uh, recognition. And um, it goes one step further. I don't, does everybody know what a Mobius strip is? It's a loop that folds back on itself, right? And to some extent, I think this continuum is more like a Mobius strip because developments now in disability rights have the great potential to develop uh, solutions for everyone. And I'm thinking now here uh, about um, universal design, right? Things that we have done to accommodate students with disabilities can be a benefit to many students, perhaps all students. And in my own law school class, where I practice uh, universal design, I'm clear, absolutely clear, that things that were done originally just for students with disabilities turn out to be a benefit to all students, right? So let's imagine, for example, that we had over here a real-time captionist, right? Who was putting up what I'm saying um, on a board. So if you ha have a hearing problem or an attentional problem, or you just want to review, or you want a, a record of what was said, you can get that real-time captioning transcript. And it's a benefit to um, everyone. So, uh, it kind of bothers me that students with disabilities in particular, teachers of individuals with disabilities, don't know all that much historically about how disability rights came about. And as a result, students with disabilities has less of a civil rights identity than I wish they would have. Because it's my belief, drawing on my own experience in life, that the extent to which you have a, a disability consciousness, that you see yourselves as part of the greater American disability civil rights continuum, the stronger and more successful an individual you will be. So um, Jamie tells me this is hyperbole, and I'm gonna say it anyway, because I believe it. So I believe that America's Achilles heel is its inability to deal with diversity in a constructive way. And I think about you know, how Vladimir Putin would like to manipulate us. What is it in our society that Putin sees as our most vulnerable point? It is uh, our ability to turn in on each other, right? And to not accept diversity in a constructive manner. And therefore, to me, it's extremely important that we learn about each other's civil rights backgrounds, right? And I don't care if you're an Italian immigrant or you, you know, hit every Jewish, lesbian, disabled, whatever. What matters to me is that you all see our common bond, uh, common bond 
uh, in that continuum, right? And I think that universal design and teaching crip history and crip philosophy and crip lit is a way to help reinforce that uh, bond. And I think that universal design, if widely implemented at a college or university, creates a common commitment. Everyone benefits from universal design and therefore we see our connection to one another much more strongly. So for me, part of the way to address our Achilles heel, to at least mitigate our Achilles heel, is to engage in universal design solutions and our shared um, history. So I wanna hit upon one way in which I think the disability community is uniquely diverse. So um, the African American community certainly does not want to be seen as homogeneous, all having the same views, the same values, the same strengths, the same weaknesses. That would be stereotyping. And I understand that. But when I compare the disability community to almost any other social movement you can think of, we are the most diverse, right? And uh, I can think, for example, even of the fact that within the disability community, there are sub-communities with regard to disability. So let's take the deaf community. There is a culturally strong, very tight community. Whereas if you were to look at the community of people with dyslexia, we have no community at all, right? We have some common researchers, right? Our moms might talk to one another, but we have no sense of community. And so one of the most important advances that had to be made before there was disability rights was agreement within the, the disability community that everyone was welcome. Everyone was welcome. And you will see that reflected in our subsequent um, actions. And I also believe that in making this decision, in making this commitment, it made us stronger and, and wiser people to deal with diverse environments, you know, in the business world, in the military, wherever it uh, may be. So before we get into the broader picture, I want to discuss our individuality, and I'm going to give you six uh, quick um, examples. So um, I start with my own brother, and my own brother's uh, story is about the individual who had the most impact on me with regard to my own commitment to disability rights. So, um, I, God damn, we were in Flagstaff. M my parents were uh, celebrating, I think, their 50th, 50th wedding anniversary, and my brother and I flew to Flagstaff to celebrate it with them. And within about six hours of my brother arriving there, he had lost control of his bowels, his bladders, and he could not stand. And it just, it came on like that. And we rushed him to the emergency room, and they told us to rush to Denver. And I rushed him to Denver. And at Denver, the doctor said to me, I can do a scan of your brother, but if I wait that long, he'll never walk again. I'm starting radiation within the hour. And it turned out that uh, my brother had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which now is a pretty darn curable form of cancer. But at that time in life, it was a certain fatality. And uh, my brother was told, roughly, you have six months to live. And my brother did a really strange thing. He enrolled in law school, right? Two bone marrow transplants, three years of law school, took the, the New Jersey bar, argued one case, and passed away. And I sat with him in the hospice, and I said to him, Richard, this is not how I would have spent the last year of my life, right? Was this a good decision? And he said to me, uh, you know, for people with cancer, dying is a process. Over time, you stop eating like most humans, you stop eliminating like most humans. You can't have sex like most humans. You can't mobilize like most humans. But 
if you can read and think and argue and analyze, you are still a human being. And what I took from that was that education is the single most valuable civil right of people with disabilities. And I can't tell you how many uh, wounded warriors who uh, have multiple injuries and know that they're never going to be employable still are absolutely determined to go to college or university because for them, education is the single most healing, uh, humanizing, reaffirming experience through which they can go. And I, so I just, I just wanna sum this up in this way. I know that for your state legislature, when they spend money on your school, they only have two objectives, research and future employment, right? Now, I just want you to understand from a disability perspective, those may not be the most important things. The most important thing may be affirming you as a human being, right? And I would like you to keep that, to those of you who are faculty members, I'd just like you to keep, keep that in mind when you have the student who you go, this person isn't ever gonna make it out there in the world. Yeah, they might not. But the process of being in your class and learning and reading and writing is an end in itself and a highly rewarding one at that. Okay, uh, I promise this is the only narcissistic part uh, of this uh, presentation. I know narcissism is very in these days, but I'm gonna try to limit it. Okay, so um, I enrolled in the University of Wisconsin-Madison and in the second semester of my sophomore year, I had to drop out uh, and was hospitalized for three weeks. I had hepatitis and mononucleosis. I'm sorry, I had pneumonia and mononucleosis. And um, the reason I got so sick is because I had tried to go to school without sleeping. And that, you know, at that age, people sometimes think they don't need to sleep. And why had I gone to school uh, thinking I could uh, go without sleep? It's because as an individual with dyslexia, learning a foreign language is like torture. If you understand what dyslexia is, you would never ask a dyslexic individual to learn a second language. Literature of Spain, great. French economy, great. But speaking French, speaking Spanish is a really hopeless, time-wasting task. And unfortunately, at Madison at that time, you had to take five semesters of, a, of one foreign language, right? And I, I just couldn't do it. So I came back to school after being in the hospital and I had to do an exit interview with a guidance counselor. And generally I'm not a big fan of guidance counselors, but this one saved my life. And he told me the secret of academic success, which I'm gonna share with you, although it might only work in Madison. Um, if, you, if you join the Italian club, you get the exams the night before. And you know, Italian's not that different from Spanish, right? So sure enough, I no longer had to struggle with a foreign language because I knew I was gonna get good grades in those exams no matter what, and I stopped staying up all night and I studied everything then, right? Which was a nice change. And uh, for my last four undergraduate semesters, I was a straight A student. Now, when I talk to the moms of kids with disabilities, they always ask me, what therapy did you try? Did you change your diet? No, actually I didn't change at all. What changed was what teachers were interested in. So being in Madison in classes of 400 with multiple choice exams and you know, check off the little grading box, um, it was all a test of short term memory and my short term memory stinks, right? But in the last four semesters, what gets valued then? insight, originality, clarity of expression. And in those ways, I was exceptional, right? And so because I was a straight A student in Madison, and also because I was living with the secretary of the Dean of Admissions of the law school, I got into law school. So uh, there are a few lessons that I would like educators to take away from my experience. One of those lessons is the kid who's struggling in your class still might end up being uh, a solid contributor to the society. 
But the more important lesson is how you learned is not necessarily how I learned. And I'll give you just one quick example. I struggled with consumer math, right? I, I took the entry exam and it showed I was, you know, not up to high school level in math. So I had to take consumer math before I could take algebra, before I could take whatever. And I struggled right then and there. And the reason, of course, is because math is about your working memory and your short-term memory, and those aren't my strengths, right? But even though I got a C in consumer math and a C in uh, introduction to algebra, I got an A in statistics because statistics became about analysis. And here's the irony. 25 years later at the Department of Education Office for Civil Rights, we were trying to figure out whether the fact that African-American males were expelled at four times the rate as, of white males in the Oakland and LA public schools, whether that was because of misconduct or whether that was because of race. And that was a statistical analysis question. And the person who came up with the statistical approach, not the two PhD statisticians we had on staff, it was me, right? Because now it was a conceptual question. And once again, I just want you to get this message, how well somebody does in the basement is not necessarily predictive of how well they'll do in the penthouse, right? And if you support people in the basement, you may be surprised as to who turns out uh, in the penthouse. Okay, another case. How am I doing for time in this section? Hurry it up? Okay, all right. So maybe we, we won't talk about each person, but I gotta talk about my business partner, Mary Lee Vance. So uh, Mary Lee Vance uh, hits all the buttons you can think of. Um, she was abandoned because she had polio. She was an immigrant from Korea. She got a PhD uh, and she's a woman of color. Have I, have I missed anything? And um, as my business partner, uh, I'm with Mary Lee in Santa Monica and we get back to my accessible van and um, there's a $760 parking ticket because we were in a, a handicapped space, right? But we had a hand tag. And um, I said to Mary Lee, I don't know what I'm gonna do, fly back here and fight it, or I, I just can't figure it out. And she said, let's go to the police department, take the hang tag into the desk and hand them the ticket and ask them to tear the ticket up. And I told Mary Lee, Mary Lee, I went through law school as an Oakland police officer and nobody tears up a ticket, right? And uh, Mary Lee said, let's go to the, pl the police department. So we went and I said to Mary Lee, you stay in the van, I'll take it in. And she says, over my dead body, right? And Mary Lee took the ticket up to the front desk, right? And Mary Lee thanked the parking officer for giving her the ticket, sincerely. And then showed her that she had the hang tag. And the parking officer, now almost in tears, tore up the ticket. And I went back to the van and being the lawyer, I was so pissed off, <laughs> right? And I said, Mary Lee, why in the world did you do that? And she said to me, Paul, you and I have problems finding handicapped parking spaces all over the country. And if the police aren't aggressive about enforcing those laws, we'll never have a place to park. And it got me to this point of the anthem of the disability rights movement, which is nothing about us without us, right? And that was the other great lesson I think that we had to learn before we were gonna have our own civil rights movement, which is, you got to get rid of the paternalism. You can't let your mom argue for you. You have to build your own alliances and you have to be willing to stand up for yourself. And Mary Lee was my mentor on exactly uh, that. And I think, mm, let's pick up one, one person. Okay. He, he's my mentor. He's telling me it's okay. All right. My favorite other example of the six, Haben Gurma. How many of you know who Haben Gurma is? Yeah, I figured. So for those of you who don't, Haben Gurma is the first deaf blind graduate of Harvard Law School. 
And if you go on the internet and go to TED Talks, I think there's like five TED Talks of Hobbin. And she's now on a world book tour at the very moment, uh, selling her autobiography because she's already 32 years old. It's time to write her first autobiography, right? And um, Hobbin is a dear friend of mine, and Hobbin is a dear friend of Mary Lee. So I, I know her pretty well. So um, I asked Hobbin, Hobbin, how in the heck did you make it through undergraduate school or law school being both deaf and blind? So it's not like she could have real-time captioners or she could see the sign language interpreter. She's got neither function. Hobbin invented her own solution, which Hobbin figured out that she could take a Bluetooth keyboard from Apple and tie it to a refreshable braille board where the pegs fall up and down as somebody types. And so Hobbin just had, in each class she went to, a transcriptionist that typed what everybody was saying, and Hobbin got the class through her fingertips, right? And it was an entirely effective way. So I could tell you how charming Hobbin is, or how bright Hobbin is, or what great company she is at dinner, or what a sense of humor she has. But here's what I really want you to understand about Hobbin. Hobbin got that necessity is the mother of invention. Hobbin decided she wasn't gonna wait for someone else to solve her problem, because there ain't that many deafblind people, right? She was gonna solve that problem. And it reinforces my point once again, that things that we originally do for people with disabilities end up benefiting all people. And I look at this campus, which Jamie proudly took me around and showed me you know, where all the ramps are, for example, and let's face it, everybody uses the ramp, right? So that's another part of our own um, community. So now uh, we're gonna get into some history. So uh, I'm Jewish. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, but when I got to high school, I moved to a suburb, and that suburb was 50% Italian immigrants and 50% Jews. And of those Jews, a very large percentage either had parents or grandparents who were Holocaust survivors. So it might not be you know, a topic for discussion in every high school, but in our high school, there really was a discussion, how did it come about? And if you think about it, it's like not exactly logical that a standard function of government and at that time, understand it was a democratically elected government. How a standard function of government is to exterminate part of its own population. It's, a, it's a, an incredibly illogical proposition if you think about it. So where did German society get the notion that actually this could be a legitimate function? it was not on the Jews or the Poles or the Gypsy Romani. It was on the disabled. And uh, this is a picture by a very famous photographer, August Sandler, who took this picture shortly before the Nazis came to power. And it's a book of the most honored to the least honored uh, level of German society. And this is the last page, the, the least, the bottom of the bottom. And this is a picture of a, individual with an intellectual disability leading around a blind girl. And at that time, genetic purity was becoming a very popular idea. If we can just kill off and make sure that people with inferior genes don't reproduce, we can produce a superior society, you know, the, the, the super society. And so how are you gonna do that? Well, one thing for sure you're gonna do is you're going to exterminate the females so that they can't reproduce. And so many, many people with disabilities were exterminated before Hitler took off on any other group. And the other sad part of this history is, um, you can't, it, it takes a lot of resources to kill someone. It takes a lot of resources to kill millions of people put together. How did Germany learn how to efficiently kill lots of people? It learned to efficiently kill lots of people by starting with people with disabilities. And so for me, 
how a society treats its most vulnerable people tells you ultimately how it's going to treat everyone, right? And um, I'm going to uh, call on my academic freedom here and say that for me personally, when I saw President Trump mock a reporter with MS, it was a very disturbing telltale sign uh, to me. And um, the other thing that's interesting and important to know is while in America at this same time, we did not exterminate anyone who had a disability, we sterilized massively. Again, attempting to achieve genetic purity. And when Hitler was challenged and asked, where did he get his racial purity codes? Where did he get his sterilization laws, which is where he too started, state of Virginia. And by the way, um, we can't get too arrogant about this because lots and lots of states had similar codes. So um, do I think that there's gonna be a disability holocaust here in America? No, absolutely not. But I want you to understand just how bad the conditions for individuals with disabilities in America um, are. So um, the unemployment rate for people with disabilities is about twice that of people without disabilities. People without disabilities are now uh, more highly employed than they were before the 2008 crash. People with disabilities still are at a lower rate than they were um, at 2008. Um, one of the primary reasons, my guess would be, is how inaccessible our public transit system is. And um, when I use BART in San Francisco, um, every platform has somebody in a wheelchair or, or a power chair, or, uh, whatever. But 75% of the New York City subway system is completely inaccessible. And that's true for Philadelphia and that's true for Boston. So um, we've got a lot to do there. And I don't know how good your paratransit system is, but I wouldn't have to want to rely on paratransit anywhere, right? So this is a serious problem. Look at our mental health system. What is our mental health system? Prison, that, that's our mental health system. And I think it's very telling that the warden of Rikers Island, which is the largest pretrial uh, holding uh, uh, facility in the United States says, I run the largest mental health facility uh, in the United States. Crime victimization rates are twice for people with disabilities as people without disabilities. And by the way, for young women in college, they are four times as likely to report unwanted touching as women who are not disabled, right? So sexual harassment for this community is a big problem. And right now, um, I know any number of advocacy groups who are very correctly focusing on the issue of immigrant detention. Because like any other population, you are going to have people who are mentally ill and people with diabetes and people with various kinds of uh, illnesses. And um, they're not being treated very well. They're not getting the services that they need. So it's a serious um, problem. Um, the reason that I went to work for the Oakland Police Department is because Black Lives Matter. And it was an issue that I really, really wanted to work on. But what I did not uh, understand and understand now is that this is also a huge problem for the disability community. One half of all African American males killed by police officers are individuals with disabilities. And go back and look at how often it is a mom or a grandma says, uh, my mentally ill child needs help and it ends up in a shooting, right? Those, those kinds of tragedies. Um, technology is making wonderful advances, but it's also serving to leave people with disabilities behind. Because unless websites are written in a careful, uh, demanding way, they will not be accessible to people who are blind because people who are blind cannot use common adaptive technology to know what's on the website. And when I look at that, I want to point out that the single most influential event that occurred before the passage of the ADA was a Lewis Harris poll, which talked about and looked at the conditions of people with disabilities in America 
at the time the poll was taken, which is 1986. And what the poll showed is people with disabilities were isolated and segregated. They did not go to the movie theater. They did not go to the restaurant. They did not go to the library. They did not go to the symphony. They did not go to the baseball game. They barely shot, right? So isolation is a very, very, ending isolation is a very, very important value to our um, community. And uh, with regard to education, there's both good news and bad news. So I'm gonna start with one piece of bad news. 33 states graduate less than 70% of their students with disabilities. Seven states, less than 50% of the students, okay? 16% uh, of individuals with disabilities do not have a high school diploma. And only 4% of individuals with disabilities hold a bachelor's degree or higher. That's a really, really small number. And I think this is on another slide, but I think this is the right time to share the statistic. 90% of all students with psychiatric disabilities drop out before getting a degree. And Jamie tells me things are better here, and, and I congratulate you for that. But talking about the whole country, this is a very, very um, serious um, problem. Okay. So now let's move 30 years forward from the Holocaust uh, to a much more positive story. And I want to talk to you about the most iconic moment, at least, in disability rights history and how much this was an intersectional uh, moment and an intersectional event. So the two laws uh, that um, pertain to uh, NAU that pertain to disability is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 and, uh, and the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. So I'm going back to the first law. So uh, you need to know this law was what was called a sneaker law, which means that no one in Congress actually wrote this law. Congressional aides and staff members wrote this law and put it into a gigantic funding rehab act, right? And it was only 35 words long and it just went in without comment, notice, or debate. And by the way, that means there's no congressional history uh, with regard to this law. So here's what I need to tell you as a law school teacher. A, a succinct short law, a 35 word law without regulations is of almost no value whatsoever. There's no reasonable accommodation requirement. There's no service animals. There's no ramps. There's no accessible washrooms. None of that is in the law. All of it would have to come from regulations. So issuing regulations becomes very important to the disability community. And um, President Nixon had something else on his plate and he didn't issue the regulation. And Gerald Ford, who was known pretty much for doing nothing, did nothing. So um, the disability community, for the first time in its history that I'm aware of, got political. And they actually sent representatives to this peanut farmer in Georgia. And they told Jimmy Carter, hey, we'll vote for you, we'll organize for you, we'll collect money for you, but you got to make a commitment to us one, that you'll issue the regs promptly, and two, that you won't water them down. Because the big fear was that when we finally got those regs issued, they'd be so watered down, it wouldn't make any difference anyway. And by the way, although a number of communities objected to those regulations, the business community, for example, the party that fought those regulations most strenuously, most overtly, most up front with the worst proposals was the higher ed community, right? And I'll just, I'll just give you one example. The comments uh, of the higher ed community were often like this. We have over 100 campuses in the California community college system. We'll make four accessible. And it's like, oh, that's like a historic black college, right? It's, it's resegregation, right? It's re-isolation. And it's like, no, that's not what the community wants. The community wants to be integrated just like any other population of individuals. 
So, <clears throat> I mean, um, nothing against the kids at NAU, but hell hath no fury like students at Cal Berkeley. It's a fact. So um, Cal Berkeley did a very interesting thing. I don't even know if they understood what an explosive situation they were creating. But Cal Berkeley had for some time been admitting students with disabilities, but it was not admitting graduate students. And it particularly wasn't admitting medically fragile graduate students. And it did this very bold thing. It took a floor of its hospital and converted it to a dorm. So if you needed to be fed, toileted, dressed, bathed, fine. If you had the grades to go to graduate school, you could still go to graduate school at Cal Berkeley. And I think you know that was a wonderful advance. But one can understand how this was an incubator, right? All of these very bright kids, right, at night would sit there and go, how are we gonna get those damn regs issued? What can we do? And this is what they did. They held a occupation of the federal building in San Francisco. And it occurred in April of 1977. And the most important thing I want you to notice from this picture is, this is not the march of the mothers of LD kids of Marin, California. These are people in wheelchairs. These are people with attendants. These are people who are medically fragile, right? This is the most disabled individuals, at least the most visibly disabled individuals one can um, imagine. So they occupied that building for 17 days, which is a record. There has never been before or since as long an occupation of, the, of a federal building. And here's the irony that I happen to know. I'm gonna dare to go back one slide. Uh, can I shine a light up there? That's my window. Okay, that's where I work. And we held a meeting, and the meeting was, should we let them come in to talk to the regional secretary about why the regs need to be issued? And we said, why not? These people are, are, are all so medically fragile, they'll go home at night. Nobody's going to bring in dogs or water hoses or look bad on the CBS Evening News because they're going to have to leave, right, of their own accord, of their own accord because they're so medically fragile. So it didn't turn out to be that way, did it? And in fact, the secretary's regional representative, a, a really sweet social worker from Guam, lost his job, but they stayed in the building, right? So, um, how did that happen? It happened in large part because of intersectionality. So, first of all, the leaders of the 504 sit-in, all individuals with disabilities, had substantial experience in other prior civil rights movements. They understood how to organize. They understood how to manipulate the press. They understood how to build alliances, all of which were important to their success. The 504 sit-in was first led by deaf persons and persons with post-polio syndrome. And um, I just want to underscore for you that uh, individuals with post-polio syndrome at this point in disability history were critically important, right? So um, at least half the leaders were female. Uh, and being there, I would have observed that they all had fire in their bellies. Right, And fire in the belly is often what makes the difference between a successful and an unsuccessful individual with disabilities. And indeed, Schweik asked this question, if the federal government had not delayed for four years, would this movement even have come about? Would it have solidified in the way it was? Or did it take a certain level of anger before it could move forward? So let's hit on this intersectionality note even harder. Food service to sustain 17 days of occupation by people who are medically fragile is a very important thing. And um, the mission rebels, so the mission is the Hispanic area in San Francisco that's close to 50 United Nations Plaza. Uh, the mission rebels provided breakfast. Um, 
Delancey Street, which is a rehab program and largely made up of former felons, provided lunch. And dinner, which was far and away the best meal there, was provided by the Black Panther Party of Oakland, California. Why the Black Panther Party of Oakland, California? Well, for two very simple reasons. One was, surprise, there are Black Panthers with disabilities, right? And in, in particular, there was an individual with MS who was very, very influential on the very top echelons of the Black Panther Party. But secondly, the Black Panther Party had earlier set forth what it called its 10 freedoms. And one of them was free health care for everyone. And the other one was nobody starves. And under nobody starves, they had been running hot breakfast programs in the Oakland and LA schools for years. They, were, they knew how to make the supply chain work, right? So when you have this political connection and then you have this need, the Panthers really, really were critical and came to the rescue. And in addition, there was an important need for security. And one other neighborhood that's very close to 50 UN Plaza, by the way, is the gay neighborhood, right? And in those days was even more segregated than it is now. And so the Butterfly Brigade, which had been um, canvassing that neighborhood every night to protect people from homophobic violence, they were the security service for the people who were occupying the building. And I want to add that uh, many of the leaders uh, I know uh, personally uh, were uh, gay individuals, but some of them, Kitty Cohn was probably like the third most important person in the whole um, uh, demonstration, was very open and out about being a lesbian at the time. And that was in 1977, which is a long time ago to be out. Okay, so um, one of the most interesting things is there was an inside newspaper that gave the news to all the other people who wanted to know what was going on because one individual was willing to sit in 24 seven during the 17 days of the uh, event. Who was that? That was the chief reporter for the Black Panther Press, right? And he is who uh, stated or recorded other people's eloquence. And I'm going to try to see this screen from here. My glasses don't quite work to the screen, but I'm going to read it if I can. To my brothers and sisters that are black and that are handicapped, get out there. We need you. Come here. We need you. Wherever you are, we need you. Get out of your bed. Get into your wheelchair. Get out of your crutches, get into your canes. If you can't walk, call somebody. Talk to somebody over the phone. If you can't talk, write. If you can't write, use sign language. Use any method of communication. That's all. All of it is open. That's about as intersectional as you're going to get, isn't it? We need to do all we can. We need to show the government that we have more force than they can ever deal with and that we can eat more, drink more, love more, pray more than they ever knew was happening. We shouldn't have to fight for our rights. They should already be here. But since we have to fight for them, we have an infinite amount of strength to walk. The government only has one strength to walk. They only know about paper and file systems. We are all in the light, and we should think of ourselves as being our rights. A civil rights identity, for sure, right? coming from a Panther member. And um, the individual on the left is, I think, uh, the most important Panther member who, with MS, gonna, needing attendant care every day, hung in for the full 17 uh, days, uh, Brad Lomax. So um, I don't want to suggest that this was only uh, from the Panthers or the uh, Chicanos. Um, there were many white people with disabilities, and sometimes we had uh, white power there as well. So the Gray Panthers, who were fighting for elder rights, um, were among the people that helped prepare food for the people who were there. And the Mill Valley Moms, which is as Tony as you're going to get, they were moms of kids who were, quote, retarded, that the word they used in those days. Uh, we would today say an intellectual disability but they were there organizing around education because they wanted their children to get an education as well. 
In addition, there was a lot of support from organized labor. And I picked this union, the American Federation of Government Employees, for an important reason, which is this was a building of government employees. And I want you to know, the government employees left their doors unlocked. The government employees helped install um, a shower in their own washroom. The government employees told people how to use their phone codes so they could call around the country to see how the other demonstrations were doing. And the United Farm Workers, which at that time was a very important uh, union, led by Cesar Chavez, was also present. And part of the intersectionality was people who had experience organizing in civil rights mentoring or advising people who were kind of new to civil rights. So on the right, I'm, you'll see a picture of uh, an individual who's strapped into a power chair, and that's Ed Roberts. And Ed was probably uh, the co-leader, the first and or second in command of the entire <coughs> demonstration. But he had as a um, mentor, Donald Galway, a blind person, who was a social worker at the Center for Independent Living, the Center for Independent Living probably being the first place in which disability rights um, was asserted. And um, Donald's kind of famous anyway, because he went to court to establish the right of blind persons to be considered for jury duty and employment by the State Department. And in both of his cases, um, he was successful. And there's a picture of Ed, and you'll notice that Ed has a tube in his mouth. So Ed is post-polio and his lungs don't work, right? So for Ed to speak, he puts the tube in his mouth or his wife puts the tube in his mouth and he takes in air, takes the tube out of his mouth and then as the air is coming out of his mouth, he speaks and maybe he gets out a paragraph. And Ed actually practiced what he called duck breathing, which is how long can you expel air so that you can speak more um, eloquently. And Ed says in, in this slide, if people with disabilities have a future, then everyone in our society will have a future, which is kind of the point I was making when we were talking about uh, Nazi history. So there was also a lot of organizing with local politicians. Uh, the very popular uh, mayor later, unfortunately, to be assassinated, George Moscone, Congressman Philip Burton and George Miller, State Senator Milton Marks, and how many of you know who Julian Bond was? So Julian Bond was probably the first powerful African-American in a Southern state legislature, right? And Julian Bond, and I, I honestly don't even know why he did it, but God bless him, he flew from Georgia and came and gave a pep talk to the people at um, the, the, the um, sit-in. So after, oh, about 10 days, the members of Congress decided to hold a hearing in 50 United Nations Plaza on the regulations. And you have to understand, this was a very brave political act because the secretary of HEW did not want yet to issue those regulations. President Carter did not yet want to issue those regulations. These people stood up to the main Democratic Party to hold these hearings. And who testified at these hearings? Ed Roberts. So I'm gonna give you a quote from Ed Roberts, but understand these words are coming out and he's thinking how much more time do I have to produce breath coming out of my mouth? This was a very difficult thing for him to do, and yet he was a great orator. So from Ed. My ability to move around and my ability to regain a pride in myself as a person with a disability is one of the most important things that has happened here today. To see hundreds of people with disabilities roll, sign, using canes, the most severely retarded people for the first time joining in in an incredible struggle is one that leads me to believe that we're going to win this because we are not going to stop until 504 is a reality. And the other person, also a post-polio individual, but fortunately with the ability to breathe on her own, was Judy Human, who probably was the single most important leader to come out of this demonstration. And I'm gonna to read to you from Judy now as well. And hold on to the last line. I can tell you that every time you raise issues of separate but equal, so this is 
we're going to have four campuses that are going to be integrated and the rest of the system is going to be segregated. Uh, separate but equal, the outrage of disabled people across the country is going to continue, is going to be ignited. There will be more takeovers of buildings until finally maybe you'll begin in to understand our position. We will no longer allow the government to oppress disabled individuals. We want the law enforced. We want no more segregation. And I would, and here we go, I can remember this moment so well. Understand now, you got four congressmen listening to Judy, right? And she's facing them. And I would appreciate it if you would stop shaking your head in agreement when I do not think you know what you're talking about. Right? That, that was Judy's personality. Right? And by the way, she was right. But to their credit, these four congressmen later became disability leaders um, when it came time to do the ADA, for example, or protecting mental health issues. So they became great um, allies. This had an impact on them. But the other thing I want you to do is study Judy's language linguistically. This could have been at a rally for African-American rights or Chicano rights just as easily, right? The issues, the words, the concepts, they're all the same. So um, here's a picture of Judy uh, now in Washington, DC. She left uh, the demonstration to take it to Washington. Look at the truck behind Judy. It has on it a lift right, that goes up and down. Why does Judy have to come in a stupid truck, not a bus, not a cab, a truck with a lift on it? And the answer is because there were no buses, there was no subway, there were no cabs, there was no paratransit that Judy could take to get around Washington, D.C. And in fact, the only way that Judy and other people in chairs could get on or off a plane was to have a food service truck, which you know lifts itself up to the rear of the plane, carry them up. And a very, very committed CBS evening news reporter persuaded United Airlines to let them use their food service trucks to take some demonstrators to Washington, D.C. And here's Judy in front of the White House. Well, long story short, they figure out Here's how we're going to get those regs finally issued. And they took the demonstration to Joe Califano's home neighborhood. And they set up a blockade around his house and around his neighbor's house. And urban folklore, I cannot confirm this is, that Califano's wife told them it's either the regs or me. Right? And they, they got issued. And more importantly, they got issued without being watered down very significantly. Right? And so this was a, a great victory. And the same tactics learned in other civil rights movements were again applied to the ADA. But look here how the disability community found its own approach. So it comes time for the ADA, and Walter Cronkite and the CBS Evening News are there with their cameras. And what people did is they got out of their chairs, they took off their braces, and they call, crawled up the Capitol steps because no surprise, the US Capitol was completely inaccessible to people with disabilities. And if you want to learn more, and I'll give Jamie these links, um, you can go see uh, the interviews that were done um, during the sit-in of many of the protesters and um, participants. So here's an interesting question. There were many federal building demonstrations around the country but only one was an occupation, and only one lasted 17 days. What was unique? What was unique about that particular demonstration? And I would argue that it was its intersectionality, because in no other demonstration was there the kind of multiple communities all making contributions to this event. And, um, you know, if I ever do another PhD thesis in my life, uh, maybe this would be uh, an interesting issue um, to write on. So um, I have a point here which I want to share with you. Um, you know, uh, the NAACP Inc. Fund had a lot of good white male Jewish lawyers working for it. 
and it brought to the NAACP a lot of legal victories. But when it came time to do Brown v. Board of Education, the unique insights and the self-sufficiency of Thurgood Marshall, an African-American male, later to be a Supreme Court justice, to argue that case before the Supreme Court of the United States. Jimmy Carter, who was an exceptionally compassionate individual, if you ask me, dragged his feet when it came to getting the 504 regs issued. It took a diverse group of students with disabilities to get those regs issued. And with regard to the ADA, our modern disability law, uh, Bush Jr. in strong distinction, excuse me, Bush Sr. in strong um, contrast to Bush Jr. was a very strong advocate for the ADA, a, a friend of the disability community. But without many people with disabilities, um, and I'm going to read them off for just a second because I want you to see the common theme here. Robert Bergdorf, post-polio. Justin Dart, post-polio. Judith Human, post-polio. Ed Roberts, post-polio. Do you get the message here? Right? Without those people deciding that they would be responsible for their own advocacy and their own protections, there would be no ADA. And every one of those people also had a history of participating in prior, uh, in prior civil rights movements, right? So they have in common polio, they also have in common an exposure to civil rights. And from my perspective, only by admitting people with disabilities into higher educational institutions, supporting them through success, implementing their accommodations, even when they're a pain in the ass, even when they're not doing very well in consumer math, unless we're going to make that commitment, then all of that list of inequities that I went through originally, unemployment and mass transit, and I, and I could give you lots more, by the way, voting, uh, emergency evacuation, all of those problems are going to continue to exist until the disability community itself gets to be policy wonks, politicians, judges, lawyers, firefighters, police officers, teachers, researchers. And so I really, I really want all of you to understand how important support of the disability community is and understand that when you support the disability community, you are supporting every other community that is included within the disability community. When you support the disability community, you're also supporting the Chicano community. You're also supporting the African American community. And of course, of course, if you implement universal design, then it's going to help raise all votes. So uh, let's talk about diversity for a second. So I, uh, in addition to being a federal civil rights prosecutor for 41 years, taught law school and I taught disability law. So my classroom was made up essentially of three groups of individuals. Attorneys who wanted to know their own rights in the employment setting, for example. People who had a brother or sister or mother or dad who had a very serious disability and they wanted to be able to help them. And highly frustrated special ed teachers. I had a lot of those too. So, uh, I, when I did my class, I felt it was very important to model universal design um, solutions. But if I had not had people with disabilities in my class, there was no chance that my class was actually going to learn the lessons it needed to learn. And I remember so well the day a student raised his hand and said, Professor Grossman, you don't know what it's like to be involuntarily committed in California. And I don't, right? But he was there to give a firsthand account of what that experience was like and crystallized in the minds, therefore, of all my students how important 
the rights of people with psychiatric disabilities are, for example? Or what are the ways in which their rights are threatened? Or what are the ways in which their needs are not served and their needs are not met? And you know, uh, the Supreme Court of the United States, at least at this point, still makes one narrow, narrow exception for the ability of private colleges and universities to take race into account in admissions practice. And you know, this is a really important issue for them. And there's a very, very strong presumption you can't take race into account. You can't take national origin into account. What's the one reason they allow an exception? The need to ensure diversity in the classroom. Even this Supreme Court gets the unique value of diversity. And as a teacher, I want every form of diversity in my classroom. But I want everyone to understand diversity has to include people with disabilities. And I'm going to take this example of Freda Kahlo. So Freda Kahlo is a hero in women's literature and a hero in women's art, as well she deserves to be. And I have also heard Freda Kahlo uh, honored because she's a Latina, as well she should be. I've also heard Freda Kahlo honored because she was able to seduce at least three really famous men, right? But you know what? I have never heard Freda Kahlo's single most important characteristic discussed in any of those classes, which is she was a profoundly disabled individual. Freda Kahlo was run over by a streetcar. And she, from there on afterwards, Freda was on crutches. Freda's painting frame had to be set at wheelchair height, and she always had to wear a brace around her body. And here is Freda Kahlo's self-portrait. How obvious can it be? Do you see her crutches? Do you see her brace? Freda understood she was an individual with a profound disability, and yet it's not taught. And I think how wrong it was that African-American and Chicano history or a Native American history or American Indian history is not included very regularly. And I want all of those to be included, but I don't want us excluded either because it's a very important part of knowing the true story and the whole story. And in addition, students with disabilities and our accommodating them is an engine for innovation in education. I think of all the practices that I had to modify in my own classroom in order to accommodate the needs of my students. And when I did it and applied those changes to all of my students, they all benefited. And I think I got two minutes, Jamie, to talk about my accommodation, so I'm gonna go off script for a second because I wanna give examples of what universal design is about. So first of all, I always turn in my highly detailed syllabus six weeks before class starts. Why six weeks? Two reasons. One is I want students to know in my class, this is how much you have to read and how little you have to read. I mean, whatever it, that balance is, I want them to understand what is the level of rigor in my class. Second, I want students to know, well, what is it that they're going to come out learning if they take my class? But equally importantly, I want Jamie's office to be able to convert my materials to Braille. And in a big settlement between disability rights advocates and the University of California, Berkeley, the University of California actually has the authority to discipline teachers who do not promptly turn their syllabi into disabled student services, right? That's how clearly they get the connection. Okay, second thing is, I'm a selfish bastard. I made my students buy my textbook. I gave it back to them in pizza, right? Which is about what you get, right? But my textbook was in four formats, right? The conventional book, you could get it in Braille, you could get it electronically, and you could get it in a, in a, a viral spinder. And the reason that's good is because then you can take out like three pages and scan them or take out three pages and read them in large print in adaptive technology. So that was um, another change. 
if you were in my class, you got a choice of one of two kinds of examination. So one was a research paper, right? And the thing about the research paper was, if you turned it into me three weeks before the end of the semester, I would give you my comments and give you a chance to improve it, which I think is an authentic you know, learning experience. I want you to learn from doing your research. If you did not want to do a research, if you like to take a paper and pencil exam, you could take my paper and pencil exam. And in law school, by the way, there's only one exam semester. So you have no idea how you're doing until it's too late, right? But if you want to take that risk, come take that risk. Because for some students, the time to do research is too burdensome. The access to the research is too hard. But do I give time and a half on my exam to students with disabilities? No, I don't. What do I do? Do I give an unlimited time exam? Yeah, that's exactly what I do. Well, but wait a minute, Paul. If you give unlimited time, somebody's going to turn into, you know, a 35 volume book. No, because I do set a word limit. No time limit, but there is a word limit. Now understand how job related this is, because if you file a brief in the Ninth Circuit, there's a word limit. So I need to know, can you separate the wheat from the chaff? Can you set your priorities? Do you know what's important and not important? How succinctly can you write? All of those stressors are actually brought in because I've set a word limit. But if you need you know, lots and lots and lots of time, be my guest. And one other thing I do on the written exam, I allow every student to bring in two sheets of paper in which they can write down anything they want. Case names, paradigms, quotes, I don't care. Because I know I don't have a good short-term memory. I'm not gonna test the short-term memory of my students. I wanna know their insights, their ability to be critical thinkers, their ability to be original thinkers, their ability to be persuasive. That's what matters to me, and that's how I set my exams. So, okay, Jamie, take a deep breath. We're gonna be almost perfectly on time. But that's because Jamie like lectured me about this for like two hours today. Okay. So first point is, I think today at least, may not have been true in the original African American civil rights movement, but today at least, all civil rights movements are intersectional. And the more intersectional they are, probably the more successful they're gonna be. But uh, the disability community is probably uniquely intersectional because we have 40 kinds of disabilities within our own community. And we have Chicano, African-American, gay, lesbian, I, I'm probably missing something, uh, individuals within our own movement. But that breadth is probably also an asset if we uh, embrace it. And I was thinking about um, what it is that we got from those other movements. And I think the first one is how to frame issues, right? We talk, uh, Ed, you know, Ed Roberts and Judy talked about justice, equality, equity. Those are all concepts and terms that came from the original African-American civil rights movement and then the Chicano rights movement. And then we had to both learn an old lesson and create our own. And that is in the definition of equal. So in the African-American civil rights movement, equal means similarly situated people should be treated the same. Identical treatment is equal treatment. But in the disability community, identical treatment is not always equal treatment. If, oh, anybody who can make it up these stairs can come into this building. Well, that's identical treatment, but it's not equal treatment. So can you see how we had to take those frames and rework them a little bit, right? We also benefited from the fact that there were people who were willing to be our mentors. And now, of course, we can mentor other people as well. And as a lawyer, I didn't have the time tonight, this ain't law school, but I, I do want you to understand, you know, there's this thing called precedence where a court looks at an issue in a certain way and it uses a particular paradigm and it reaches a particular outcome. And then the next similar case that comes along, you want to use that same paradigm to get to whatever outcome you're trying 
to get to. Well, interestingly enough, the most valuable first paradigms, segregation, slavery, came from the African American rights movement. The notion that identical treatment is not always equal treatment actually came from the Hispanic Latino civil rights movement. And it came up originally in bilingual ed cases where kids were coming to school with no ability to speak English and the teachers were giving them the same curriculum as everybody else, but that wasn't working. And without that precedent, I can tell you for certain as a lawyer, without that precedent, there would be no reasonable accommodation. There would be no ramps. We would be stuck back at identical treatment. So this same process of borrowing from the past uh, also exists under the law. And I then take this all back to our discussion of the Nazis and the notion of genetic purity. And I think about racism, sexism, ableism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, homophobia, fear of immigrants, any fear of others. I think there's an underlying core stereotype, which is that there's something immutable, a, a gene, a trait, a, a cultural heritage, whatever, which is going to make these people in some way inferior, right? And if you think about it, it's thinking about all these things as being a form of disability, right? Because if, you're, if you believe somebody's within themselves inherently inferior, then you're talking about a disability, right? And there's this universality of discrimination when you think about it in that way. And I think it's very important, therefore, that all of our communities bind together to address our common issues. For example, you know, on the Black Lives Matter, this is a very important disability issue as well. Healthcare policy is important to the Black Panthers. It's also very important to the disability community, right? And that takes me finally all the way back to universal design because I thoroughly believe that every institution that will support and implement universal design, instead of watching us further fight against ourselves, further tear ourselves apart, empower our enemies like Putin to attack our Achilles heel, we instead can stand together as one strong community and defeat that enemy. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh, thank you, Paul. You're welcome. Thank you all for coming out and um, helping support this, and really appreciate the Paul's willingness to to come here and just engage with us uh, around this. Candlelight. <laughs> all by candlelight. So I, I know we do have the space for a little bit of time. If there are folks that have questions, if you'd like to come down and ask a question or if you want to raise a hand, you're a hand and I'm happy to come by or if you just want to um, come up and talk to Paul afterwards, I'm sure he'd be happy to do that. So if not, you're also free to... So I know there are faculty out. people here, and I really want to reach out to them especially because I've given you something to think about in your own classes, right? And I hope you will. All right. Matthew says, I teach disability studies here at NAU. I was lucky enough to go to Berkeley. And I bring in Berkeley. And I do bring Berkeley into class.
because I want my students to know, I want my students to I want my students to become the next generation of activists. Oh, yes. Good. Me too. Yeah, keep it up. I have a question online as well. Um, a participant is asking if um, Harvey Milk showed support during the Section 504 sit-ins. I would be shocked if Harvey Milk hadn't, but I can't honestly say that I remember, but I'll, I'll go you one better, which is I'll ask, because I still know the leaders of those demonstrations well, uh, although being post-polio, they are dying off but there are enough of them still there, I will ask. I, I certainly know that Harvey Milk's community participated, and I know that there were any number of gay people in the leadership of that demonstration. Thank you. Check, check, one, two. <laughs> Thank you, I had um, given a list of questions to my students who may be zooming in to consider, and one of them was, um, what it was the triggering event and that brought the communities together for the demonstration and the sit-in. So for those of us, or my students in particular, who don't know the history, could you tell that story? What was the triggering so I, event? I think yeah. the triggering event was uh, Cal Berkeley created the pressure cooker. I think that was part of it. And then people thought they had a promise from Jimmy Carter. And at some moment, they not only realized that Carter wasn't going to keep his word, but more importantly, that the regs were beginning to slide backwards. All of a sudden, it wasn't like we got to hold the line. It was like, oh, we got to prevent damage. And it became clear that time was of the essence, that if, if there had been more time to debate this issue, to discuss this issue, probably weaker regs were going to come out. And I think um, that pushed it. One other interesting fact uh, that I only learned recently, um, uh, Netflix is about to put out a um, movie called Crip Camp. And there was a hippie run camp in California where many of these people originally met, right? People talk about, oh, I had my first kiss at Crip Camp. I played baseball for the first time at Crip Camp. And I think that was where, for many of these people, their eyes were first open to the notion of being a community of their own. And so going all the way back to that experience, like, I don't know, early high school through graduate school. And of course, some, some of these individuals had gotten their undergraduate degree and hadn't planned to go to graduate school, but couldn't find a job. So I'll give you a really good example. Judy Human graduated second in her class at Columbia Teachers College. And the New York public schools would not hire her anywhere because she was, quote, a fire hazard, unquote. That kind of is going to enrage you, right? It, it's going to give you the fire in the belly to go fight this issue. The other thing, Ricardo, I, I think that um, triggered some of the concerns about slippage uh, with the regulations was most of the arguments that were starting to come up were about how much is this going to cost? And I think that got people really fired up because they're talking about their civil rights and getting these regulations implemented and the political pressures were about it's going to cost too much money to do this. And so that, I think that really, um, that really fired up the participants to say, you know, we can't let this continue and, and our rights for, for access and participation shouldn't be equated with dollars. Hi, Paul. Um, so you have mentioned Brown versus Board many times this evening yes. and the whole concept of separate is not equal 
And right. in, in association with that, you, you kind of concluded with sometimes uh, that separate or different is important. Um, you know, equality is not always equal. Uh, I'm wondering if you could just briefly comment on yes. so I, inclusion. I, I, okay. <laughs> In that so, context. So first of all, let's not conflate two things, though. When you build a ramp to this building, you are not treating everybody identically. You built the ramp for a subset of people, people with mobility impairments. But the purpose of the ramp is to get everyone into the building. The purpose of the ramp is to integrate the mobility impaired community with the non-mobility impaired community. So to me, that's the opposite of segregation. It's just saying to integrate our communities, you might have to build a ramp. You might have to do something different. So that, that's one. <laughs> Two, one way in which disability law is distinguishable from all the other civil rights laws is sometimes segregation is a necessary evil. So disability law has a strong presumption against segregation, but does not absolutely prohibit it. And, I, and I'll give you the perfect example, special ed schools, right? If kids who need to be in special ed are the only kids placed in special ed, it makes sense. And in California, I don't know about in Arizona, but in California now, the community college system is really dealing with the fact that many, many parents of kids with intellectual disabilities or kids on the autism spectrum want to go to college. That's good. And some of those kids will do fine in the regular um, uh, curriculum. But some of those kids, the only way they're going to get a meaningful experience is a segregated cu curriculum. Community colleges doing programs just for kids with intellectual disabilities or just for kids on the autism spectrum, right? So once again, there's a presumption everybody will be treated the same, but there's also a valid basis for separation. Now, inclusion is more of an elementary and secondary notion than a post-secondary notion. And inclusion to me posits integrate kids with disabilities as much as possible into the regular program of instruction. It doesn't say there's never a time when there should be segregation, but it says never segregate unnecessarily. It really must be absolutely necessary before you move to that solution. My answer today is, well, we need to be thinking about universal design at the elementary and secondary level as well, because the more we implement universal design in elementary and secondary ed, the less there's going to be a legitimate reason to have segregated education for some kids in elementary and secondary education. But I would recognize that for some kids, that's really what needs to be, right? At least part of the day, right? Thanks. I think, yeah. How do we get um, university departments, law schools to talk about what the independent living movement is, because I think that that is, there is the civil that a lot of people think the civil rights movement is the black people, and that's it. Really, it's how do we get the schools and the business community to understand what inclusion and civil rights is, even though we have. ADA there, discrimination is still happening. So to me, um, this is a matter of history if we can drive it in the right direction. What I mean is when I went to college, there was one African-American history class. There were no women's history class, no women's lit classes, and Chicano history, American Indian history just did not exist, right? Now, at my school and most universities, all these things are taught. And what I want is now to add in Crip Lit, Crip, Crip History, and, and so forth. But I'd like it to be introduced in an intersectional way. I'd like it to be introduced as the history of civil rights in America, in literature, right, in music, 
in history, in law, right? And by the way, uh, most law schools have a class called critical race thinking or critical race analysis. And it focuses on that very issue of how you look at civil rights questions. And what I want to do is make sure that those classes ultimately get to national origin, gender, sexual orientation, and disability, right? And I, I think we're headed in that direction. But I have to also tell you, um, at 72 years of age, I have a good enough federal pension that I don't need to do this, right? And seeing how important exactly what you've asked for is, I go around the country selling disability rights, selling civil rights, selling intersectionality, selling universal design. And that's because I recognize exactly how important this mission is. And God willing, it'll head in the right direction. But that I see the country right now not headed in that direction is either I can give up, which I'm old enough that I have the right to do that, or I can fight even harder. And at least right now, I'm fighting even harder. Thank hold, on, hold on, Russ. We, we got people online, so we want them to hear it too. I thank you for your words tonight. You inspire me. 40 plus years on the job as an advocate is a difficult thing to do. Um, it's not a friendly thing to do. It's not a comfortable thing to do. Um, so uh, you've touched my heart. I, thank I you. appreciate your words tonight. I appreciate your appreciation. <laughs> Seriously. Thank you. Um, I'm actually a high school student here in Flagstaff, and the way you were speaking about the way you run your classroom is something that I never have seen in classes before in at least our public education here in Flagstaff. And I wanted to ask how I might be able to bring that subject up in my school through student leadership or anything that would actually be helpful in moving classrooms in that direction because I think that that's a way our like special education system it won't be so so separate from everything else because at this point it is and that's something that I don't find okay because classrooms that students usually go in are not run accessibly. So I think that Jamie, I don't know if Jamie heard, the, I'm gonna put him on the spot in okay. part for your question but let, let me say this, I'm surprised at how many college campuses have significant numbers of students with disabilities. They even have classes about disability, but they're not organized as a civil rights organization. They don't get that fire in the belly going, right? And I think if you don't ask your question as a group, like to the faculty senate, for example, it's not gonna happen. The one thing I will say is where I've seen it happen is usually very incrementally, but you know, first step. Let's like think about what would be the most valuable change that every single student, not just disabled students, every single student would appreciate. So I'm gonna give you an example from my own law school. Uh, every non-seminar class in my law school is recorded and then it is paired with the PowerPoint. So you can go online and you can hear my words and you can see my PowerPoint. And so um, I had some individuals in my class who came and visited me in my office, but never went to class. And they were severely wounded warriors who lived at the VA hospital, but they were going to law school, right? And with this technology, they could do it. But think about this technology for every single student in my class. Right? Anytime you miss class, you can go online and hear it, right? You're reviewing for finals, you're gonna write the, the written exam, you can go online and hear it. All my PowerPoints are up there until the semester is over so they can see it. Now, some teachers might be afraid, well, then nobody will show up. I just can't worry about that kind of stuff, right? And I'm not worried that that's gonna happen. It isn't what happened, right? And so it's not a problem. Now, on the door of every classroom in my law school, there's a sign that says, 
Once class starts, do not presume that what you say is a private matter, right? Because it's being, if it's not a seminar, it's being recorded, right? If you had real-time captioning in all your classes, do you think your student success rate would go up, right? Stanford is working right now on whether there's an all electronic way to implement real-time captioning in all its classes. And I don't know how well they're doing, right? But I can see why that would be a wonderful uh, uh, boost for every single student. Jamie, the question was, what can students at NA NAU do to so get nice. faculty to start adopting some universal design practices. And I thought you, you could speak to that easily as well as I could. Well, I think that students either at the university or at the, you know, at the high school level could, you know, as Paul mentioned, organize, come together as student government, maybe create student clubs. So Danielle's down here with NAU for all, right, to bring those issues forward and ask for what you feel like would be helpful and beneficial for all students. At the university, students are welcome to come to the Commission on Disability Access and Design. And the commission is right willing to take that information forward and ask for things uh, that we believe can enhance the experience and access and success of all students on campus. That's one thing that we really try to focus on is design on campus. We recognize that design for disability access is also something that's gonna benefit everyone so you not being afraid to step forward and say hey we're, we're going to get together here's what we think would help us because the truth is um, at the high school at the university our mission is to successfully educate students and if students can say here's what could help us be successful you know I, there's a lot of power in that and student voices uh, are often the ones that can really help make that change at an institution. Because we're here to serve you. Um, we should be providing you things in the way that you find really helpful. Um, so based on the questions, I think that we are a pretty like-minded group in this room. Um, and if we were to make our own society, a lot of these things, the biggest obstacle to implementing them might be cost or apathy. But I'm just wondering, in the wider world, are there people when you present these ideas who have a more passionate like pushback and they're upset about it? And if there are, what what those uh, quarrels they have with it would be? So as Jamie pointed out, one of them is money. And of course, there are arguments that some of these things actually wouldn't cost money at all, right? I'm not sure how many universal design things actually would cost money. Like turning in my syllabus early, what, what's that got to do with money, right? So, but that, that's one of them. S second one is people who cannot accept the notion that sometimes identical treatment is not equal treatment, then feel that an accommodation is unfair, right? And of course, I'm giving my accommodation to everybody, but, but this notion that this is unfair, uh, I'm making the student dependent, not independent, in the real world, in the employment world, the student's gonna have to do X or Y, so I'm not preparing them for that world. Now, most of those people don't know what the law requires in the employment world, I might add, but I go back to my brother's position, which is whether I get a job or not, that's my choice. If I choose to pursue this education, the education in itself is the end and the right, right? So I, I don't buy into that um, ne nearly as much. But the other thing I want you to know is there are people who are far more familiar than I am and far more talented than I am in exploring universal design, right? And I don't think universal design is even the, the correct word anymore. And that there's some other word. But I, I lecture once a year at the Harvard Graduate School of Ed, and they're talking about universal design all the time, right? They're also talking about inside out classes and flip classes and so on, I, they're getting a little, but, uh, but um, clearly there are lots of people thinking about this. And if you want, if you want to meet one, you know, he's just sitting two seats over from you. <laughs> so he could talk about that universal design stuff.
I know. So you, you, you know how the comedians always say you've been a wonderful audience, right? But you have. And I appreciate very much the support that I've gotten tonight. It's a, it's a very emotionally rewarding experience. And, um, you know, ideas spread like fire. And I hate to think about that and sitting in California in the dark. But uh, it's true. And if you all want to start spreading these ideas and thinking about them and exploring them more, you know, God bless you for doing it. So thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Stay warm. <laughs>